All right. Now, we're looking at Amos here. Amos is, of course, he's a, a shepherd. He's a, a tender of sycamore figs during part of the year. He's prophesying, focusing on the northern kingdom of Israel. And he's up there, up there preaching. And he gives, you know, he, he, he first circles the nation of Israel with these oracles of judgment. And then he focuses, beginning in chapter 2, verse 6, on Israel, and that runs through chapter 6, verse 14, through the end of chapter 6. So 2, verse 6, through the end of chapter 6, we have these various oracles of judgment against Israel. And just to remind you, the first oracle of doom is in chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. The second oracle of doom, chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 3. Then you have in chapter 4, verses 4 to 13, a kind of explanation of, of the doom in terms of their refusal to repent under God's discipline. You remember he said, I did this to you, yet you didn't return to me. I did this to you, yet you didn't return to me. I did this, I did this, I did this. It was like he was going, will you wake up? And each time you refuse to heed my discipline where I was trying to draw you back to me. Then in chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, you see the lament over Israel. As I said, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It doesn't, he's not rejoicing when people won't turn to him, but he's going to judge them. And you see that lament there. And then in chapter 5, verses 4 to 17, you get an explanation of the coming doom in terms of their refusal to repent at his invitation. Not only did they refuse to repent when he brought discipline into their lives over and over again, trying to get their attention, they refused to repent at his direct invitation when he's saying, you know, return. Seek the Lord and live. And they wouldn't heed that. And when we ended, we were looking at chapter 5, verses 18 through 27, which is a rebuke of the rebellious who, uh, they, they, they're rebellious, but they wind up, they, they trust in their religious ritual for their peace with God, even though they're living in rebellion to God, as he's laid out all over the place. They, they wind up trusting in this ritual that they do this and think that satisfies God. The fact of their false security is given in chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. You see, these Israelites, they lived in rebellion to God, practicing idolatry. They're abusing the poor and the underprivileged. They're muzzling the prophets. They're ignoring God's call to repent, both in, through discipline and through direct invitation. And yet, what are they doing? They're longing for his coming in judgment. It's like you sit here and you go, well, you know, you, are you crazy? You're living in rebellion to God, yet you're longing for his coming in judgment. And God tells them in 5, 18 to 20 that they have no business longing for that day. That's not going to be a day of their vindication. That's not going to, for, in the, for them, it's going to be a case of out of the pan into the fire. You see, that's the thing about, well, it's like fleeing this one, only to be eaten, grabbed by a bear, getting loose and getting in the house, going, Shh, only to be bitten by a serpent. This idea that you're going to sit here and say, listen, uh, no, 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 fine, come, Lord, it'll be a great day. Our vindication, he says, are you crazy? It's not going to be that for you at all. Then in chapter 5, verses 21 to 24, you have the question, you know, how can somebody so deceive themselves deceive themselves into thinking that they're right with God, looking forward to his judgment, thinking his judgment is going to be their vindication when they're living in... How could they get to that point? And I think you get the answer in 521 to 24 that the source of their false security was their religious ritual. You see, they, they had convinced themselves that by their doing certain things and performing certain sacrifices and offering these things to God, that they were at peace with God despite being in rebellion to him. You see, it doesn't matter if I submit to God, if I live to God, if I express my faith in my life. That doesn't matter. What matters, do I do these certain things, burn these certain things, then God's cool. And God says that kind of worship is disgusting. Worship that is offered from a rebel. Worship that is offered from someone, from a faith you see that that doesn't find expression in life. You know, do you think he needs these things? You see, and he says that's disgusting. Well, I want to pick back up in 525 to 27. 
He says, did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sychoth your king and Cayune your star god, your images that you made for yourselves, and I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Now, there's some you can translate this differently. NIV uh, translates it a bit by not taking these as, as proper names of these idol gods. But either way, the point is, is that here they were engaged in idolatry. And he says, you and your idols, I'm going to ship off. It's just like, you remember we've looked at what God had promised Judah? How he said to them over and over the southern kingdom, if you don't repent, I'm going to come against you. I'm going to come against you. Then we studied lamentations, and you saw the effect of God's destruction. of Well, this is the northern kingdom, and he's telling them the same thing. You see, this is before. This is in the 8th century. And he's saying, I'm going to remove you. I'm going to take you into exile because of your recalcitrance, because of your refusal to repent. See, God is certainly not being hasty here, is he? He's not being hasty. Their disloyalty is of long standing. They defected from him as early as the wilderness. They defected from God that early. The wilderness period, you can see, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 10 to 26. Turning to idols, being fixed on idols that early. And thereafter, they continued to show disloyalty to God in many forms up to all that he's saying about them today. So it's not like he's jumping the gun that he's eager to punish somebody. That's not his character at all. He's slow to anger, abounding in love, patient as patient as patient as can be. Urging, appealing, begging, come, 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 be faithful, be faithful, repent, repent. But there comes a time when he'll bring judgment, and that's what he's saying to them, you see. For such persistent loyalty, disloyalty, such persistent disloyalty, they will be taken into exile. And that, of course, happened. The Assyrians, you know, the good times are rolling when he's saying this. They're, they're all puffed up. They're feeling powerful. And the Assyrians come. In 722, 721, they finalized their uh, capture of the northern kingdom with the destruction of the city of Samaria. And the people are carted off. And he says in chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, now I, I chose the New English translation. Kind of the base translation I'm working off of is the English Standard Version. But I use the New English because I think it's easier for you to see how I understand what's going on from the New English translation. He says in 6, 1 to 3, Woe to those who live in, in ease in Zion. So he's not giving Jerusalem a pass. You see, he just says, you guys kind of share a common spirit here. In Jerusalem, as you know, in 587, 586, the third wave, they're going to be destroyed too. So he just kind of mentions, throws them in. He says, woe to those who live in ease in Zion, to those who feel secure <clears throat> on Mount Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. They think of themselves as the elite class of the, of the best nation. The family of Israel looks to them for leadership. They say to the people, journey over to Calna and look at it. Then go from there to Hamath Reba. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are they superior to our two kingdoms? Is their territory larger than ours? You refuse to believe a day of disaster will come, but you establish a reign of violence. You see, the leaders of Israel here, you have people, they're giving the people a false assurance. That's what they're, why they're doing. They're giving the people false assurances by pointing to Israel's greatness in comparison to other people. Other, uh, their neighbors. They say to them, look, you know, journey over to Calna. Look at these places can't compare to us. Look at us. You know, we are strong and large and powerful. We're in our prime. You see, we're better than all of these places. So they're giving these false, this false assurances to them by, by pointing out their greatness in comparison to their neighbors. See, they thought, their, what they, they thought their nation was too powerful to be subdued. Who's going to touch us? You see, who is going to touch us? Look at us. Look at our strength. Look at our size. Look at our might. Who can touch us? And so they give these people these false assurances this way. 
thinking they're too powerful to be subdued, they dismiss prophets like Amos as what? Chicken littles. That's what, see, people who are saying, doom is coming, you have to repent, doom is coming, you're going to be destroyed, chicken littles. Oh, the sky's falling, the sky's falling, I'm paranoid, something bad's going to happen. You see, that's how they did, now look at us. So when the people come to them, what do they say? You don't have to pay attention to that kind of nonsense. Look how powerful we are. Look how powerful we are. See, all the while, when he says here, you refuse to believe a day of disaster will come. They just blow that off, reject that idea out of hand. He says, uh, but you establish a reign of violence. See, all the time they're rejecting the notion of God's judgment against them. They're, They're inflicting terror on their own people by injustice and oppression. Here you have, you know, they trample the heads of the poor. They take bribes. They don't do right. What are they doing? They're corrupt. They're absolutely corrupt. And they refuse to think they're going to be judged. Well, worldly measures, worldly measures of strength and success can deceive one into thinking one is above judgment. That's just how it is. Worldly measures of success can deceive one into thinking one is above judgment, see? But divine judgment is not based on worldly measures of strength and success, and it cannot be thwarted by them. that's That's not the test. Worldly measures of strength and success. God looks at the heart, and if the heart's not surrendered to Him, the fact that you're the richest, the most famous, the most powerful person in the world, that will mean nothing. You know, what do you think you're going to do? Take your, you know, your diamond necklace and show it to God on the day of judgment and say, look what I have. Do you know who I am? Do you know how many times I was mentioned in the paper? Do you know how many blog posts there are about me? Do you think that's going to matter? But it's easy, you see, to latch onto those things and to deceive yourself into thinking. These worldly measures are, are put me beyond judgment. I, I read to you this last week or the week before to the church in Laodicea, says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Look, man, I'm fat city. He says, Not realizing you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. The fact you're rolling, the fact your congregation is wealthy and prosperous and all that stuff, that's not the test. The fact is, is that you are in spiritual reality, wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked, and you must repent. You must turn. So this idea of worldly measures of success, they can be very deceiving, a big trap in which one can place one's confidence. 6, 4 to 7, he says, Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. This is just speaking of luxury. You see? Who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those to go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. So here you have people, see, they're wallowing in luxury. Everything is fine for them. They're on beds of ivory, drinking bowls of wine, everything. They've got the best of everything. They're living high on the hog. All is well with them. They couldn't care less about what their greed and exploitation was doing to, the, to Israel. What they cared about was, I'm sitting fine. He sits here and he says, but they're not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. They don't care about the fact that their corruption, their greed, their exploitation, what it's doing to the nation of Israel that it is bringing the wrath of God. What do they care? I got a bed of ivory. <laughs> you see? I've got bowls of wine, I'm living in luxury, and what do I care? And he says, look, uh, 
their bank account's not going to exempt them from God's judgment. It will not exempt them from God's judgment. In fact, they're going to be the first to go. And as I say, it's so easy to trust in wealth for security because that's how the world operates. You see, the rich person can always get what he needs and then some. That's why wealth is such a trap because you think that by it, I can always meet the situation. Wealth is the key to meeting whatever situation there is. So if I have it, it is my source. It is what I trust in. I will use it, and I will get out of the situation. If there's no water, I will buy water. If there's no this, I will, get, I will buy it. I will buy it. I can always find somebody to get it because I got money. So you wind up putting your confidence in that. That becomes your source, and you wind up trusting that. But see, the amount of one's wealth isn't going to count on Judgment Day. It's not going to count. Only the heart that controlled the wealth. Only how one used it. It's not going to be a thing. God comes and says, hey, uh, people of Israel, let me see. Let me, hold it. Let me, let me check your accounts. Okay. Uh, no, you, that's, you got a lot of money. You're good. Does anybody think that? You see, we would never say it, but we, it's easy to live like that. That that's really where our trust is. I mean, this is not something new. I mean, that this temptation, all the way back in Deuteronomy, what does God say to the people there? He says, take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commands and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up See, I'm great, I'm powerful, I've got, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart... My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. So you see this idea that wealth is something that is easy to fall into the trap, that that, that is the basis of my standing with God. Even if you wouldn't say it, you think, I have my confidence in that. God, we're exempt from judgment because we are powerful. We have wealth. We have these things. He says, that's not relevant. That's not relevant. You see, in James chapter 5, now here's a situation where you have unbelieving rich people who are persecuting the poor Christians. And James says, come now, you rich people. Weep and wail over your coming misery. Your riches have rotted. What good are they? All this stuff that you're trusting in that you think is going to exempt you as you, as you persecute and mistreat the poor Christians. He says, your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted and their rust will serve as a testimony against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Look, the wages of the workers who reaped your fields which have been withheld by you. Now why is that? Because they're greedy for money. Why would they not give to the worker what the worker deserves? It's because I can stiff the worker. Because I'm powerful enough to do it, and that means more for me. See, that's the spirit. He says, the wages of the workers who reaped your fields which have been withheld by you are crying out, and the cries of those who reaped have reached the ears of the Lord of armies. You lived in a self-indulgent life on the earth and lived luxuriously. You fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You condemned and killed the righteous man. who He does not resist you. So do you see this idea? It's long-standing. It's powerful. This, the, the temptation to trust in worldly measures of success and power and all that. And this is what Israel is doing. And God is saying through Amos, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Of course, you know, in 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19, Paul tells Timothy, command those who are rich in the present age not to be haughty or to have their hopes set 
on the uncertain. What does he mean? Have their hope set on the uncertainty of riches. That's what I'm telling you. It's easy to trust in that as my security because that is the source. That is how I always am able to exist and to live and to improve my circumstance and do those things. So it's easy to become a false god. And he says, command those who are rich at present not to be haughty or to have their hopes set on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us all things for enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and sharing, thus laying up for themselves a good foundation for the future that they may take hold of the real life. The heart that controls the wealth expresses itself in how it uses it. And that then has meaning to God. The fact of the wealth means nothing to God. You see, you can't appeal to that and be exempt from judgment. Then he sits here in 6, 8. He says, the Lord God has sworn by himself, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his strongholds, and I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. Now, this is pretty powerful here, you see. The Almighty swears to deliver up the city. Samaria, the capital of Israel. The time has now come. He has been patient for a long, long time. He has disciplined. He has appealed. He has some, and people just keep going, yo, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Me, me, me. I'm going to live. I don't even see him. Where is he? Why should I order my life? Because I do this and I don't really see the negative consequences. In fact, what I see is I have ivory, I have bowls of wine, I'm rolling. So I'm beginning to think, what's, what's in it? And he tells them, listen, the time has now come and he swears. He swears he's going to deliver up the city and all that's in it. And I think about the judgment on the impenitent at the return of Christ. It is no less sure, it is no less certainly told to us then when he says here, the Lord God has sworn by himself, I will deliver up the city and all that's in it. I have decided I'm going to do this. You and I, we look at the text like 2 Thessalonians. What do we see? The judgment on the impenitent at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. No less certain. No less sure. Paul says this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering since it is a righteous thing in the presence of God to repay affliction to the ones afflicting you and rest to you along with us who are being afflicted. This will happen at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. When he meets out punishment to those who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will pay a penalty of eternal destruction, separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all who have believed and therefore in you because our testimony to you was believed. So I see God, you say, well, you know, God's clearly, he's, he's revealed to them this is going to come and this is going to happen. He has clearly revealed to us that a judgment is coming. And so it is a, an, an appeal. is an appeal for people to, to repent. Now when you look at this, this here, in, in verse 8, in flaming fire, when he meets out punishment to those who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, I fear that sometimes some people have taken this idea when it says those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and turned it into a thing that all that matters is that I was dunked in the water. Okay? That kind of ritual, I was dunked in the water, and that's the key. Well, I've obeyed the gospel of Jesus. I've been dunked in the water. Now, I understand the role of baptism. But you understand, don't you, that baptism is simply the culminating expression of saving faith. It's not magic. I don't sit here and just say, okay, I don't care. Just throw me in the water. You see, throw me in the water and that's all I need, I'm covered. It is about a heart that has surrendered to God. And in that penitent faith, cries out in submission to baptism, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. You see, so this idea, uh, if someone reads that that way, they're stripping out the rest of the New Testament. 
You see, baptism is important. Baptism is essential. But the notion that baptism is simply about the water and divorce from your surrender is nuts. Okay? Crazy. Biblically speaking, doesn't have any, it, it is about the heart and you see it, you see this idea throughout the Bible is that God is concerned with a person's heart. And that's what happens here and that's what we wind up. You can see other texts, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. There are many texts that speak of the judgment at Christ's return. Now why are they in the Bible? They speak of it and say, listen, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. You speak of it just as God reveals himself. I'm bringing judgment on the city. I'm bringing judgment on the impenitent when the Lord Jesus returns. And people need to hear it. And people need to pay attention to it. You see, 6, 9 to 11, he says, And if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. If ten remain. So something's happened. And then you have if ten are remaining after whatever's happened has happened, they shall die. And when one's relative, the one who anoints him for burial, shall take him up to bring the bones out of the house and shall say to him who is in the innermost parts of the house, is there still anyone with you? He shall say no. And he shall say silence. We must not mention the name of the Lord. For behold, the Lord commands and the great house shall be struck down into fragments and the little house into bits. This is an illustration you see of the judgment that he's bringing. He's he says, I, I swear, I'm bringing it on the city. And then here's a picture of the judgment that he's bringing. Households are decimated. The occupants who survived the first wave of judgment. If ten men remain in one house, the first wave of judgment has come. Ten men remain in the house, what happens to them? They die. They die, whether it be from plague, whether it be from natural disaster. But those who are left after the first wave of judgment, they're in their house and they wind up dying. Family members who come to retrieve the bodies, they find a lone individual in this house hiding among the corpses. Presumably somebody who entered after the occupants had died in the hope of finding uh, hiding, finding some kind of relief from God's judgment. So here you have a house Ten remain, they die, somebody's in that house hiding among the corpses, hoping to find escape from the terrifying judgment of God. And then somebody comes in here and they whisper, and it's so terrifying, so great is the punishment, that when they call him, he warns him, he says, listen, silence, we must not mention the name of the Lord as though saying his name may bring another wave of, wave of wrath. It's that terrifying. And we got the idea, you know, hey, yo, God, judgment, no big deal. I don't care. Yeah, judgment. That's why I keep telling you. you see, I'm, I'm telling you because I want you to be aware. It's not going to change your thinking. If your thinking is, you know, kind of a casual thing, you know, kind of a yo, what up thing, not going to be like that. Not going to be like that. The judgment of God is a terrifying thing. See, the terrify, a terrifying thing. Now, the judgment on the wicked at the return of Christ is described in even more fearful terms. Isn't it? I read this to you a while ago. Other, we could have pulled out many other texts. Matthew 13, he says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown in the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men threw it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As I said, if, if you want to say, look, that is a symbolic portrayal, well, that's fine with me. Okay? That's a symbolic portrayal, but it's a symbolic portrayal of what? Of a horrible, horrible condition. You see, however much you symbolize it, you can't bleed from it, the horror of it. That's why it's said this way. Is there anything worse than a fiery furnace and you're sitting in there, what are you doing? Are you styling in that furnace? Are you being cool in that furnace? Or what does he say? Weeping and gnashing, grinding of teeth. Well, what's that a picture of? That's a picture of the ultimate bummer. Okay, that's the ultimate bummer. 
That's the place, the last circumstance you would ever want to be in. And so when you see these depictions, you see God telling them, look, it's going to be like this. Then Amos says in 6, 12 to 14, do horses run on rocks? The answer is no. Does one plow on rocks with oxen? Not if he's sane, you see. But you've turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You who rejoice in Lodabar, who say, have we not by our own strength captured Karnaim for ourselves? For behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, the God of hosts, and they shall oppress you from Lebo Hamath in the north to the brook of Arabah in the south. Your entire area, you're going, you're going to be uh, oppressed You're going to be defeated. You're going to be destroyed. I've raised up a nation. This nation is going to come. That nation came. That nation destroyed. And so he he does it. He tells them that. You know, they've done the unthinkable. It's just crazy to think of horses running on rocks, plowing on rocks, but they've done the unthinkable. You see, by turning justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. How have they lived? How have they acted? How have they treated one another? They've ignored their covenant responsibilities. They've acted like God doesn't exist, and I will run things the way I can get away with running them. Why? Because I can. Because I'm powerful. Who's going to stop me? Well, there is a judge. (laughs) There's a judge, and he says, listen, you can't be like that. You can't treat me like that. We have a covenant relationship, and I've called you to much greater than that. And because you've rejected me and rebelled against me repeatedly, 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 I'm now bringing this nation against you. Like chapter 7, he says, I took the NIV 2011. NIV was a, what was, it's always being edited, but a major edit was taken in 84. It was edited again, I think, in 2005 called the TNIV. And then there was a, a last edit was in 2011. Uh, which this text didn't change from CNIV. But I like it just because it says easily uh, how I understand this. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord showed me. So now you see what we move. We move from these oracles to prophetic visions. See, now, he's, he, now he has these prophetic visions that the, that the Lord is showing him. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord showed me. He was preparing swarms of locusts after the king's share had been harvested, and just as the late crops were coming up. When they had stripped the land clean, I cried out, Sovereign Lord, forgive! How can Jacob survive? He's so small. So the Lord relented. This will not happen, the Lord said. This is what the Sovereign Lord showed me. The sovereign Lord was calling for judgment by fire. It dried up the great deep and devoured the land. Then I cried, Sovereign Lord, I beg you, stop. How can Jacob survive? He's so small. So the Lord relented. This will not happen either, the sovereign Lord said. See, God reveals to Amos the judgment that he's bringing on Israel, symbolized first by this locust plague. And locust plagues, we look at them and say, well, how, how horrible is that? Well, we talk about droughts. We have droughts, and everybody says, this is really serious. This is a bad thing, bad thing. Well, you just can, this is a drought by locusts. <laughs> they go come and eat everything. And see, people in that world, this was horrible. That was their food. You know, it's not like, okay, if my crop's done, I'll run down to the store and buy some more. You see, so this is a serious, serious judgment symbolized here, you see, symbolized here by the, by the locust plague that he's bringing on Israel, and then by the fire. Well, fire, you know, that's obvious, right? I mean, it's licking up all the water, everything, just burning everything. You say, man, this is absolutely terrible. What? Oh, symbols of judgment that are powerful. And Amos appeals to God's compassion to urge him to spare Israel, and God relents and what? Withholds the judgment. You see? He says, hey, I'm going to show you something. Look at this, locust plague, that's my judgment on Israel. Oh, Lord, please. All right. I'm going to show you something. Here's a fire, it's my judgment coming on Israel. Oh, Lord, please. All right. 
Okay, so what is being, what is being said here, you see, as, as chapter 7, verse 8 says, we'll, just, we'll look at it in just a second, I will spare them no longer. See, literally it says that I will, I will walk away or walk by them or, or no longer walk by them, meaning I won't spare them. You see, I'm not going to ignore them anymore. And so in 7, 8, it suggests, see, this sparing of Israel from his revealed judgments what does it demonstrate? It demonstrates the Lord's great patience. I'm going to do this. No, no, okay. I'm going to do this. No, no, okay. I will spare them no longer. What is he doing? Patient. What has God been doing? No, no, God is mean. He's just sitting here. He's just this angry God who can't wait to destroy people. That's the caricature, see, that our society tries to pump out there to scare people off the truth of who God is. That's all that's designed to do. And I see them. You see, they get by people. Oh, no. Yeah, this is God. This is God. I see them at work. And sometimes, frankly, it makes me angry. Now, I don't know if that's always good. But it does. I see them doing this to people. Feeding them this stuff. Twisting stuff. Why? They just want them to reject God. And I see the forces at work that are behind them. But you wind up seeing this. So here you see God's patience here. As Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, which we'll read in a second, uh, maybe next week. But the Lord is patient with us, not want, wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to what? Come to repentance. That's the heart of God. That's the nature of God. He's been after them, after them, disciplining them, appealing to them, urging them, begging them, begging them. Then time comes judgment. But he's patient in it, right? That's what he's being demonstrating here. And then he says in 7, 7 through 9, this is what he showed me. The, Lord's, the Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. Oh, man. I just picture, you see this? God Almighty standing with a plumb line in his hand. He says, and the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed, and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. See, Amos sees the Lord standing with this plumb line in his hand, and he tells him he's setting a plumb line. He's setting this line among his people Israel, and he'll spare them no longer. God is patient. That's what you see in the preceding verses, you see. He's patient. He relents. He relents. He's patient. But there's a day of judgment that's coming, and Israel is going to be judged for its deviation from the truth, from it, for its rejection of the truth that God is God. That's the truth. He holds the plumb line. And how have, they, how have they treated him? How have they acted? Have they acted in accordance with that truth? No. They've rejected that truth. They've acted like he's a joke. They've acted like he's somebody at their disposal, their magic genie. They haven't acted like he's God. And he's going to judge them by that standard, they chose to live contrary to the truth that Yahweh alone is God. What are they doing? They're worshiping idols. Well, what is the truth? The truth is there's one God. How are they living? Like there are multiple gods, and I don't frankly care about this one, and I don't care about my covenant with him. I don't care about my covenant responsibilities. So he says, the plumb line is set among the people of Israel. They act, they, they live contrary to the truth that Yahweh alone is God and contrary to their covenant obligations. The fact that they are gods carries with it what? Responsibilities. How are you to treat people? How are you to treat the poor among you? Is not this what it means to know me, says the Lord? How you treat the poor? How you treat the powerless? How you treat the underprivileged? How you treat those who aren't in a position to defend themselves? Yes, and how, what have they done? Whoever's got the money, the poor dude gets steamrolled. He gets steamrolled. Corruption, injustice, oppression. 
Well, what is that doing? Is that living according to the plumb line that God is God? That our relationship and our covenant carries with it responsibilities on your part? No, it's living contrary to the plumb line. And what does God say? I've set the plumb line. And now judgment is coming. And we need to remember that. You see, while the Lord is patient, a judgment is coming. Now, I know this isn't popular to say. You say, I know that. You say, oh, but people don't, well, they don't want to hear about it. I, look, I don't care. <laughs> it's part of the truth. And it has to be said. What would we say to the people who wrote these things? Well, you shouldn't have written that. You know, you really shouldn't have written that. Look at, look at Peter. Then we'll be through. 2 Peter 3, 3 to 13. Know this first of all, that in the last days scoffers will come with scoffing, proceeding according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For from which time the fathers fell asleep, everything continues as from the beginning. Let me just finish this. Everything continues from the beginning of, uh, as from the beginning of creation. For this is concealed from them wishing concealment. That by the word of God the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed from water and through water through which things the world then existing having been deluged with water perished. That's the flood of course. And by the same word the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one thing, but, but do not let this one thing be concealed from you beloved. That with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow concerning the promise, as some regard slowness, but is patient toward you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, at which time the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be dissolved by being burned up, and the earth and the works in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus being dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be with regard to holy forms of conduct and godly deeds while awaiting the hastening and coming of the day of God? How should you live in light of the truth that this day is coming? It's not like it's irrelevant. You should live holy and godly lives because a judgment is coming. The plumb line is set. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I'll finish and that's it. Okay. While waiting, hastening the coming day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved by being set on fire and the elements will melt by being burned. But in accordance with this promise, we're awaiting what? New creation, new heavens, new earth. The ultimate makeover, the transformation of fallen creation into the divine utopia. The new heavens and the new earth where we will live in resurrection bodies in which there will be no suffering, mourning, crying, or pain. That's the judgment coming. All right, I'm through. Sorry, I was over time. Thanks.